You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 6, Sonnet 5. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and more importantly for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. Please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 5. Those hours that with gentle work did frame The lovely gaze where every eye doth dwell Will play the tyrants to the very same And that unfair which fairly doth excel the lovely gaze belongs to Shakespeare and is framed by the sonnets which have been created with many hours of careful work for that purpose. When the sonnets say every eye, it means a number of things. Firstly, it refers to each sonnet, each one being an eye of the sequence, both eyes in the thing we look out of and eye for individual. Secondly, it refers to Shakespeare, who wrote this sequence full of love and sadness and gazed upon each sonnet both when writing it and when reviewing it. Thirdly, and perhaps more importantly, it refers to the reader's eyes. Those hours will play tyrants to the eyes. In Shakespeare's case, he will be unfaired by the time he invests in the sequence as he will become older, less youthful, and will also have less to write because the sonnets will have depleted his creative store. Those hours of writing will play tyrants to the sonnets, because once Shakespeare is dead, they will miss him and mourn him all the more for having spent such quality time with him. As for the reader, the hours of reading and rereading, if the premise of the attached poem, A Lover's Complaint, is correct, will play tyrant to the reader's eyes and mind, not only by controlling the reader in a unidirectional relationship, by, by but by wasting their time in an activity which will give them less back than the sonnets will gain from it. For never resting time leads summer on to hideous winter and confounds him there. Time, throughout the sequence, is a conflation of Father Time, being Kronos or Saturn, and Death, as in the Grim Reaper. Shakespeare uses the seasons to divide life into four stages, with spring being a metaphor for both youth and the water in which Narcissus sees himself. And here the meaning seems clear. Time will take Shakespeare from the prime of his life and leave him to die when he's old, and his death will take the sonnet sequence from their prime into the hideous winter of an eternity with no guarantee of ever being read. As we'll see in the next few lines, however, when the sonnet speaks of summer's distillation, the metaphor appears to be a bit more specifically intended. The sequence's summer is Shakespeare, with these two lines specifically talking about him dying, and the next two referring to the sonnets in their winter. Sap checked with frost, and lusty leaves quite gone, beauty o'ersnowed, and bareness everywhere. Sap and lusty leaves are interesting because they take the rose metaphor of the sonnets and suggest that the ink is sap and the pages are leaves. This evokes an image of the pages of the sequence disintegrating in the eternal winter. Sap had a couple of meanings in Shakespeare's day, the obvious one being the sap of a plant, but the second being a tunnel or trench built to conceal an assailant's approach to a fortified place. This takes us back to Sonnet 2's Dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, which suggests the words in the lines of the sonnets attempting to sneak into the reader's consciousness. Check, in Middle English, was a word derived from chess and meant stop or control. And so, sap checked with frost can be read not only as a rose that doesn't grow, the sonnets, but also as the death of Shakespeare thwarting his attempts to influence or possess the reader. Then were not summer's distillation left, a liquid prisoner pent in walls of glass. Summer's distillation is Shakespeare's spirit distilled into the sonnets, and when we read A Liquid Prisoner, we are reminded of Narcissus's reflection looking out from the water, trapped behind walls of glass. In other words, Shakespeare's reflection is trapped on the other side of the looking glass. For those of you familiar with the Harry Potter universe, Warning! Spoiler alert! What Shakespeare is describing is much like the horcruxes that Voldemort uses to achieve immortality. Beauty's effect with beauty were bereft, nor it, nor no remembrance what it was. 
Beauty's effect in this case is the sonnet sequence, and if the sonnets weren't recorded, then the moment Shakespeare died, all of his unwritten ideas and memories would die along with him. But flowers distilled, though they with winter meet, lease but they show, their substance still lives sweet. Lease in Middle English meant to cut, sever, separate, loosen or lose. Substance meant being or essence. If Shakespeare were to write himself into the sonnets, his death would merely be the end of his physical body, but his spirit would continue to live on. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking, and please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an x. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not Not like like the the others? What if I say I'm not just another one in your place? You're You're the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? surrender?